For over 50 years, the British Touring Car Championship has been one of the world's most popular motorsport series. This is the story of the legendary drivers, the legendary cars, and the legendary moments that have made it such a success. The man's an animal. This is Touring Car Legends. course, John Easton Gibson briefs his drivers. Men, we want no biting, butting or gouging and we leave it to you when to break. Now come out of your corners fighting. The first ever British saloon car race was held on Boxing Day 1957 and was won by Tommy Sopwith at the wheel of a Jaguar Mark I. The first race I did in that car I was spending Christmas with my parents near Winchester and I drove it to Brands Hatch, put the numbers on it, won the race and drove back for dinner. And you sure as hell couldn't do that today. The inaugural 1958 championship would be fought out between Sopwith and his Jag and gentleman Jack Sears in his Austin Westminster. That car was a rally car owned by BMC, British Motor Corporation. They sold it to me. So it was my car, but they sort of looked after it. They did the engine on it, and uh, I had plastic numbers which I put on each door, and then I had to take them off before I went home because the rules said you must not drive home with your racing numbers on because it would create a bad impression for other road users. And so that's how we carried on. This was production car racing in its purest form. Everyone drove to the circuit in the car they raced, and they wore their Sunday best. Everybody was a bit more formal way back in the 50s, and I, I was in the habit of nearly always wearing a tie, and it never occurred to me, actually, to take it off. I just used to tuck it in my shirt, and I didn't have any overalls. I had a helmet, uh, but uh, it just got on with the job. Back then, touring car racing was split into different classes according to the type of car. Sopwith and Sears both won their class, and at the end of the season had the same number of points. The organisers wanted to declare an overall winner and suggested they flip a coin. Both of us held up our hands in horror and said, you're not getting away with that. We haven't raced all year to spin a coin to decide who's the winner. You've got to think of something else. The solution was a head-to-head -head shootout at Brands Hatch. Tommy Sopwith and Jack Sears were each given an identical 1.5 Riley and told to get on with it. Two five-lap races all to themselves, changing cars in between to make it all fair and above board, with the winner decided on aggregate times. And off they went on their needle match, with their rain tumbling down. Sopwith kept his lights on for identification purposes. Tommy had the headlights on, I had them off, that's right. See how wet it was. Tommy hung onto his lead and came in with 2.2 seconds to the good. Tommy, of course, won the first race five laps, and we came down on, on, onto the start line, changed cars, off we go again for another five laps. Not far to go now, but if it gets any darker, they're going to need radar. They're fantastic watching this. Brings back all the old memories. L lovely wallow in, in nostalgia. I love the music they played at that time. And Jack Sears takes the flag and the championship. Thanks for the loan of the Rileys, Marcus. And congratulations, Jack. Finally, the checkered flag went out because I was looking in my mirror to see whether the gap for me in the second race was bigger than the gap he had created in the first race. They added the two race times together, and I won the championship by 1.6 seconds. That was how they decided the tiebreaker. Well, looking back on it, I mean, I must have been a halfwit to agree to drive BMC cars against the number one BMC driver. Obviously, if I had the same choice with the advantage of hindsight, I would think up a different solution. But as it was, I got beat, and that was that. Be seeing you, and goodbye for now.
Jack Sears, Tommy Sopwith and another early protagonist, Sir John Whitmore, really were gentlemen racers. Whitmore was educated at Eton and Sandhurst, while Sopwith's father gave the world the Sopwith Camel and the Hawker Hurricane fighter planes. But even in these early days of touring cars, they competed against the very best. The Formula One stars of the day all drove saloon cars some time or other. They were very, very versatile. You never see it today, of course. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. In 1958, Sopwith found himself going head-to-head -head with Mike Hawthorne, who was on his way to winning the Formula One World Championship for Ferrari. That was the Grand Prix meeting in 1958. Michael Hawthorne, who was then the number one driver for Ferrari, and Michael was a Jaguar dealer in Farnham and was very friendly with Lofty England, who was the Jaguar team manager. And so he said that no, he was going to drive another car at the meeting. And then he went on to be the first British world champion that year. That was one of the few moments when I was in front of Michael uh, and we finished a little further apart than that, uh, but the other way around. But as he was the world champion that year, I do not mind being beaten by him. Hawthorne was just one of many Formula One stars to grace the touring car paddock in those early days. Graham Hill won the Formula One World Championship twice, the Indy 500 and Le Mans, but still had time to win eight touring car races from 1961 to 63. Reigning Formula One World Champion Jim Clark even won the championship in 1964 while driving for Lotus and its founder, Colin Chapman. He was incredible. He joined Team Lotus in 1960. Colin Chapman had spotted his ability racing at Brands Hatch in one of the Boxing Day meetings, and they had a, a unique ability to, to work together so well. He won the Saloon Car Championship in 1964, Jimmy being congratulated, everybody's smiling. Big, big cup, big silver cup. I don't look very happy, but I must have been. There wasn't anybody like him before Jim Clark, and there hasn't been anybody like him since Jim Clark. He was so dominant in his day and had this wonderful, smooth style, had this fantastic partnership with Colin Chapman, which is, I think, without doubt, the greatest engineer and driver partnership in the history of Formula One, better even than Sebastian Vettel and Adrian Newey nowadays. He just drove instinctively and so very, very well. Jim Clark was also a hero of two-time British touring car champion John Cleland. He was the Scotsman that was winning everything. He was the cool guy. He, he won Formula One, he won Indy, he did everything. He drove saloon cars in the British Touring Car Championship at odd weekends and won the championship. For me, that was the main part about winning the championship in 1989, was to actually take home the trophy that had Jim Clark's name on it. And that was, you know, for me, just fantastic. He was serious. He wouldn't talk very much. He didn't want to talk to people. He didn't want to talk to journalists or anything. He couldn't make a decision. I mean, he, he used to live in my flat sometimes in London, and uh, it was called a Scottish embassy for that reason. But... Um, <laughs> But when, he, when we were there in the evening, I said, do you want to go to a movie or do you want to go to a restaurant? And he said, well, we, one or the other, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I need something to eat. What food do you want? You know, do you want some Chinese food or there's this restaurant? And so he said, I don't know. He said, you just have whatever you want. And he was extraordinary like that. He didn't make decisions. But when he got in a car, he was very, very clear what he was deciding to do with the car. But outside a car, he couldn't make a decision. I still reckon that Jimmy Clark was the most gifted driver of all time because he would get down to a, a time on lap three or four and Graham was still chipping away the odd bit of a tenth uh, at the end of the second day's practice. It was just raw talent. While Clark led the way on the track, Graham Hill dominated the post-race parties. Fun character. Absolute fun character. Totally self-made racing driver, of course. He, uh, he came from nowhere, he was a mechanic, and, and uh, he made a, a career out of motor racing, 
and he was brilliant. He would fool people, you know, he would le lead people up a garden path sort of thing and do funny things sometimes and that sort of thing. And he was not a, not a, a, usual, a usual person in that way, but I mean, I actually felt that a lot of racing people in those days were not very usual people because they were crazy go racing in the first place. Graham was elected the after dinner speaker of the year by the Toastmasters Association. And you can't get a higher compliment than that. I mean, he was a, a hellishly funny man. I regarded it as a, a, a complete boost for saloon car racing, that these Formula One aces were in there dicing against us. Sometimes I was able to beat them, sometimes I wasn't, but uh, it was still a good fun trying. And Formula One drivers were not the only celebrities to be found in a touring car. The series even attracted the interest of a young Hollywood actor. <laughs> the early success of touring car racing saw the paddocks packed with some of the world's leading Grand Prix drivers and even Hollywood celebrities. Sir John Whitmore, having already won the 1961 championship with a race to spare, handed over the reins to his American movie star friend, Steve McQueen. He and I met riding motorcycles. He was very keen on cars and motorcycles, and I had motorcycles at that sort of time, and we talked a lot about it. And when it was coming up to the last race, I said to Steve, why don't you drive my car? Because I don't need to drive at Brands Hatch. And, uh, he said, yeah, I'll do that. He was a very good driver. I mean, he was extraordinary on a motorcycle as well. And he did very well. He was an extraordinary person. We did a lot of crazy things together that, uh, um, funny things that you shouldn't do and get away with. With the 60s in full swing, touring car racing enjoyed its first golden age. Steve Neal is now the team principal of the Honda UASA touring car team and the father of triple champion Matt. But in the early 60s, he was a promising young racer living the dream. It was a fun time, really. There was a, a sort of atmosphere about the place. It was electric, the 60s. Everybody was making money. There was no recessions or people weren't being laid off or anything. There was nothing going on that was bad. And it all added to that fun, the, the Beatles and the uh, Carnaby Streets and all of that was brilliant. For Neil and many of his contemporaries, there was only one choice of car for the budding racer. And the Mini was absolutely the ideal car. Right place, right time. The cars were very basic, as you can imagine. They weren't anything dramatic and technically advanced at all. With a Mini, you'd drop it down on its bump stops and go and drive it, was the philosophy. Now, for those of you who are new to Mini racing, we should point out that it is a tradition amongst the drivers that somebody should spin on the first lap, if possible, at the narrowest part of the course. In the early days, we didn't even have roll cages. In fact, we didn't even have seat belts to start with. It was, uh, you had a fiberglass bucket which you sat on or in, uh, it depends how lucky you were, and it was probably homemade and uh, it would wobble around. And you just had to hang on to the steering wheel. And this notion of little steering wheels to steer them, because you got no power steering, so the thing was solidly on the ground. So you had the biggest possible steering wheel you could get on it, and you'd sit as close as possible and wrestle it round the corners. It was very crude, very crude. Another Mini, number 77, shows the right way to take a bend. And the wrong way. For the driver, it's not as bad as it looks. A damaged pair of glasses and a broken tooth. Various things happened when I was trying to get into racing, but I was impressed by the Mini of it at speed on the corners. So I just played around with the Mini on the road. I mean, it was only an 850, so it didn't go very quick. And what I found is you'd go flat out anywhere. I mean, you just didn't have to slow down with the Mini. I mean, Brands Hatch, you, you know, you, you, you go flat out on every corner, even Druid's Bend and everything was just nothing for a Mini. Druid's Bend echoes to the patter of tiny tires. I was accused of doing all sorts of crazy things in a Mini because I was putting them in very funny angles. That was interesting to me, and people said, why are you racing this little box, you know? And I said, well, it's fun. I really enjoyed racing it. And then if you do something and you do it like you want to, you're going to be successful anyway, and that's what I was.
The Ford Cortina also began life as a humble family car, but in the hands of Lotus founder Colin Chapman, it became an iconic racer. In a special factory just north of London, an even more powerful version of the car is developed, the Cortina Lotus being brought to racing trim for the 1964 season. I had that distinctive uh, colour scheme, the white bodywork with a green flash, and there's Colin Chapman talking with a couple of the lads. Colin Chapman, Wizard of Lotus, is always available to advise and check the work of his experts. Colin Chapman was very much involved in the running of the race team. That was his passion. The men who build the Cortina mark with pride that their car has won more races and rallies than any other saloon car ever before. We used to come regularly up to Snetterton and drive them on the road and that was all good fun because the mechanics used to drive them up and back and the A11 then was quiet. You could get, get up to 100 mile an hour in a Cortina, and no trouble at all. Brands hatch again on the English bank holiday in August. A battle royal to be fought for the British Saloon Car Championship. Jim Clark in Cortina 146 has six victories already in the bag and raring to go for that vital number seven. Never has a car and driver been so well placed for this championship so early in the season. Here was a front-running Formula One team with arguably the greatest driver of all time tackling the British Touring Car Championship. Not until the super touring era of the 1990s and the arrival of Williams Renault will we see its like again. Three Cortinas flash over the line and Jim Clark's lead gives him his seventh victory in seven consecutive meetings. The British Saloon Car Championship, won for Ford by Jack Sears in 1963 when the Cortina first turned out for this event, was happily followed by the Clark victory in 1964. Jimmy Clark was famous for his driving of the Cortinas and he could get them up on two wheels. And, uh, you know, the, um, the commentators enjoyed all this and, and the crowds. That whole Lotus Cortina thing with the, with the three wheels, you know, Brian's hatch down at the bottom bend with a wheel up and Silverson on the Grand Prix track again, just wagging a front wheel. That was something that, you know, about touring car racing, about racing saloon cars. And for me, that was really why I got involved in it. Jimmy Clark used to say, it's fun to drive them. If you're enjoying what you're doing, you're going to put on a good show. And it was very friendly as well. The racing was competitive, but at the same time, you could go and talk to the boys with the galaxies and the mini boys. And, you know, we were all, all in it together. One of the few men capable of taking the fight to Clark in 64 was Jack Sears, who, by the time he won the title for a second time in 1963, had swapped his Austin Westminster for a Ford Galaxy. What the American bruiser lacked in finesse, it made up for in brute horsepower. And it still has a place in Sears's garage. I derived just as much satisfaction and just as much excitement from winning the championship the second time with this galaxy. Because nobody thought I could do it. When it first came over, everybody gave each other a dig and said, whoa, the wheels will come off. It'd be a hell of a handful to corner. But it did handle well, and the wheels didn't come off. So it surprised everybody, including me. A V8, 450 horsepower, seven litre engine, that's the, the powerhouse of the car. Snetterton, we might possibly be just about touched 160, but probably nearer 155. The, the difference between the standard car and the NASCAR race cars, uh, this front mud guard's all fiberglass, fiberglass, aluminium front bumpers. The seats you see here were standard seats for the car. We were not allowed to put in bucket seats. And these seats are the actual seats that I used in 63. The competition dashboard here is all competition instruments, not, of course, standard instruments. The steering wheel is standard. That was the normal steering wheel for this car. And uh, it was required under the rules and regulations to have a fire extinguisher. And that little fire extinguisher down there qualified. I don't think we'd have done too much good. But nevertheless, we did carry a fire extinguisher. It was an exciting time, but one laced with danger. In 1968, Jim Clark was killed in a Formula 2 car, racing for Lotus at Hockenheim. 
Steve Neal recalls the effect it had on the touring car regulars. The great catastrophe that took place really in my 60s years was the death of Jim Clark. I think that hit everybody because he was such a nice guy. He was Mr. Nice Guy of motor racing. And the shock he was, it was never going to happen to you and it was never going to happen to Jim Clark. And the fact that it happened to Jim Clark made us all think about our own vulnerability. The death of Jim Clark uh, was something like the death of President Kennedy. Anybody who, who was alive at the time can tell you where they were when they heard that President Kennedy had been assassinated. And equally, people can tell you where they were when they heard of the death of Jim Clark. I was always shocked at the number of people who either had serious injuries and they were limping or whatever it was, and they would forever, and uh, the people who had actually died. You know, I was just shocked. I'd got into racing in the first place rather because I wanted to prove myself to myself and then I felt I could do something, well, why go on and kill yourself? Why not quit when, you, when you're still OK, you know? That's what I really thought. I didn't want to go on doing it. As the 60s rolled into the 70s, an Aussie came to the fore. Frank Gardner had raced in Formula One, but was most comfortable in a saloon car, winning back-to-back -back championships for Ford in 67 and 68, before winning again in 1973 while driving a Chevrolet Camaro. Well, Frank had the most wonderful sense of humour. He made me laugh all the time and he made everyone laugh because he spoke in a peculiar way. But he, he said the most amazing things. I mean, he was just a very different sort of human being. You can visualise the bone-shattering ride that a thing like this gives. You know, it shakes all the buttons off your overalls. I suppose that's why they invented zippers. I really enjoyed driving with him because we always had a lot of laughs, you know. And, uh, you know, always when something would happen in a race, he would always have a joke to make afterwards, you know. It was always funny. And I really enjoyed Frank Gardner. He was a lovely guy. For all Gardner's success, touring car racing was still a class war. Bill McGovern wasn't winning races outright, but his Hillman Imp took him to three successive championships from 1970 to 72. I think the Hillman Imp was an amazing, iconic car. The car was so superior to anything else on the track. George Bevan used to build the engines on the kitchen table in his house. He was an absolutely brilliant engineer. 10,000 revs in every gear. The handling and the gearbox, the gear ratios, everything else were so advanced, so highly tuned that I wasn't doing a lot of dicing. I was going out there at a measured pace to amass the points. The early 1970s also marked the arrival of a man who would go on to win 60 races and be a pivotal figure in the championship for the next 20 years, Andy Rouse. A brilliant engineer, Rouse worked for Broadspeed, the team responsible for his Triumph Dolomite. I was an engineer primarily because I worked at Broadspeed on the shop floor and eventually became a manager of the racing department, but I, I raced the cars and did all the test driving as well. So, you know, I was, I was quite well involved and, uh, you know, it, um, it was something that I could do that not many other people could do and, that, you know, that ability stood me in good stead right through my career. The Dolomite was a tricky car to drive, really. It was good in the fact that it was the only car on the grid with a 16-valve 2-litre engine, so the engine was quite, quite good but the, uh, the car itself was fairly basic, really, because the rear axle was held in with a rubber band, so that was a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a difficulty, and it had, had no brakes. It had small, uh, solid discs, and so it wasn't a performance car as such. But with a bit of engineering, some, some, a few clever tweaks, we managed to get it to go quite well, good enough to win the Touring Car Championship in 1975. Rouse was part of a new breed of racer who saw it less as a gentlemanly pursuit and more as a professional career. My focus was on engineering, so I worked hard and uh, long hours and, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty fit and healthy anyway, so driving the car wasn't a, a difficulty at all, really. And, of course, they weren't high G-force cars or anything, so, um, you know, I was always fit enough to do the job, but, uh, you know, preparing the car and getting the best out of it was really my focus. Andy Rouse was a, an absolute pro. He was an engineer 
with a brilliant mind and most drivers will come in and say, well, it's got a wee bit of understeer or it's got a little bit of oversteer through the fast one there or this needs doing. Andy would come in and say, it needs two clicks on the bump, three in a rebound and take one of the you know, softer spring on the back. And he would tell you exactly what the car needed. I remember Andy as a very quiet, deliberate, uh, extremely bright chap who's, who's basically uh, a superb engineer but he also has this great talent as a driver. And it's not very often that you get people who can wear both hats, the engineering hat and the driver hat. His meticulous attention to detail was already much in evidence. Rouse even designed and built his very own fitness machine. So this is a machine that I devised to uh, get my fitness up, my arm strength and hand strength. So you just sit here and watch your TV and just keep doing this for about half an hour each way. I mean, it's, it's efficient in the fact that it builds your arms, your shoulders, your hands, your grip and your thumbs all in one go. So it saves going down the gym for hours doing lots of different machines. These days, fitness is a big thing in racing, but it probably wasn't in those days, but the cars were quite heavy and hot to drive, so you needed to be fit. When I exercise on this machine, I'll be wearing loads of clothes and my racing suit and jumpers and all sorts, so it get really hot. <laughs> But Rouse's commitment contrasted sharply with another of Touring Car's great characters, Gordon Spice. I never went to a gym in my life. There was never any question of going running or getting, uh, get, going to the gym to get fit. Away they go in superb style, up to the first right-hander. Spice had first entered the Touring Car Championship in the 1960s at the wheel of a Mini. Gordon Spice nearly loses it. Gordon Spice really is driving absolutely on the edge now. Just overdid it a bit too much. If Sears and Sopwith had been gentleman racers, then Spice was very much a player, in tune with the spirit of the 1970s. It was the, the swinging 60s, which went on into the 70s. People had a much more relaxed attitude towards relationships in those days. And uh, certainly we took advantage of it. There was a good camaraderie between, between the races in the, in the 70s. The competition was intense, but uh, no, we had some good parties. And yes, we used to drink far too much, most evenings. And I used to make the excuse, I need to sleep well the night before a race. <laughs> but uh, then they started talking about bringing breathalysers onto the grid, which was quite a good reason to give up saloon cars. <laughs> Even his trademark Griffin helmet had a dual purpose was a fairly revolutionary helmet at the time with a big opening for safety features, we said, but actually it was safe. You could smoke a cigarette without taking your helmet off. And they were very, very popular at the time. We sold them all over the world. Gordon always amused us because he always had a cigarette in the car. He'd be sitting on the grid smoking a cigarette, and as soon as he, the race had finished, the flag had dropped, he'd be lighting up a cigarette on the way around the slowing down lap. <laughs> For the 1980 season, Spice invited Rouse to join him in a Ford Capri dream team. Yeah, there was lots of Capris. For a while in the championship, there was, uh, there was big American V8s with Stuart Graham and, you know, some, some of those really big cars. But uh, when the, the rules changed and the championship reverted back to, a, I think, a three-litre maximum, then the Capri became the car to have. Those were really good days, lots of great racing. I can remember my dad taking me to Alton Park and queuing up behind the pits to get the autographs of all the guys, there was Stuart Graham there, Jerry Marshall, Gordon Spice, all in the Capris. And um, it was fantastic, I just loved it. I loved the part of it. And I was stood on the banks watching with everybody else and got my autograph book, which I've still got to this day. Gordon Spice will have to call upon all his vast experience of motor racing in order to win this race. I remember I won 27 races in a Capri, and that was a record at the time. They were delightful cars to drive, very easy. You could get them at ridiculous angles. It didn't help your, the lap time. You had to try and be neat with them. That was what we spent our time on setting them up so they were easy. Because easy cars give you confidence, and it's all a matter of confidence how fast you go into a corner. They were absolutely idiot-proof, as far as I'm concerned. We wait for the lights to change. There they go, and it's a very good start for Gordon Spice. And Vince Woodman goes with him. Andy Rouse is going well. But see, the two Rovers are also there. In fact, how can all these cars go through cops on the first lap? Teammates Spice and Rouse would have many close battles throughout a dominant season. And all the time, this battle now between the two team cars really seems to be set for a proper cliffhanger. It's still Andy Rouse, but Spice is worrying every inch of the road. 
Look at the dent in the door. Have they had contact between them, we wonder? On the straight, into the braking area. This time, I think he's made it. Yes, he has on the inside. Gordon Spice leads the race then. Andy Rouse in second place. I had a contract with Ford. I ran a two-car team, and I tried to get the best drivers to fill the second slot. And I was lucky enough to get Andy a couple of years. And here, Andy Rouse looks as though he's going to try and go through on the inside. He does. He's on the inside at Old Hall. Always a difficult manoeuvre. And so it's a tremendous battle between the Gordon Spice Racing Capris. Down into Nickerbrook once more. Spice is right in behind Andy Rouse. He's not going to let this one go. But it's Rouse who leads through Nickerbrook and up over Clay Hill once more as he's just ahead of his teammate Gordon Spice. Across the line once more. Which of the two Gordon Spice Capris is it this time? It's Gordon Spice back into the lead just ahead of Andy Rouse. And it's a race win, a 1-2 for Gordon Spice Racing. And we thought that it was going to be a dash for the line, and there was a time when I think he actually touched you going through Nickerbrook. Uh, could be. He's, he's never very far away, that's for sure. <laughs> Tell me something. Isn't this going to present difficulties for you at the end of the year if you two are going to be battling it out? And it, I must say that from a spectator's point of view, it's great, great motor racing. But uh, might it not cause you to lose the championship? with uh, fastest lap points and things? Well, the winner of the saloon car championship hasn't come from the big class for uh, a long, long time. And I don't think, if we, even if we were driving to orders, there's very little chance of the big class having an overall win in the championship. There, were, there was competition in the team for, for the win. There was never any team orders. Here we are at Mallory Park. There's quite a good group of cars there, Capri's mainly. And there they go. Gordon Spice gets a very good start. Andy Rouse is going with him, but so is Vince Woodman. And as they come through Devil's Elbow this time, they're very close together. I won the race there, but Gordon wouldn't have been too keen on that, <laughs> even though he finished second. <laughs> he was the team leader after all. And coming up to take the chequered flag, Andy Rouse from Gordon Spice in second place. Not only did you win the race, but you also established a new lap record, so that gives you an additional point. And I think that the whole uh, question of the championship now comes into question, doesn't it? Because if it's no holds barred in the Gordon Spice team, then uh, it could cost you the championship in theory, couldn't it? Well, maybe it will, but uh, it'll be an interesting situation that's uh, going to develop during the season. There were no team orders to start with until I'd beaten Gordon about three times. And then I had a letter in the post, <laughs> which, uh, ch which changed what we could do a little bit. It was to the effect that you don't beat the team leader. <laughs> it was Gordon's team and he had to win. So after that, I was a support driver. But we still had a great time, won lots of races. While Spice's battles with Andy Rouse were generally good-natured, his relationship with a canny Scottish driver, Tom Walkinshaw, was anything but. There's no secret about it. We were long-lost enemies. We fought like Kilkenny cats. By the late 1970s, the gentlemen drivers were being replaced by players, and few played harder than Tom Walkinshaw. He would be a key figure in the British Touring Car Championship on and off until the late 1990s. But it was as a driver that he first made his name. His battles with Gordon Spice were legendary for all the wrong reasons. There's no secret about it. We were long lost enemies and we actually um, we, we fought like Kilkenny cats. Um, Tom and I did not see eye to eye. We respected each other but we didn't agree with each other. There was one race at Brands Hatch where we were both on the last race of the season. Tom had to win the race and I had to come fourth or better to win the class for the year and we had a, what was best be described as banger racing and reports coming in from every corner on the circuit uh, that saying these two lunatics are out there hitting each other and uh, at the end of the race we I think we came last and won but last but I <laughs> Tom hadn't won anyway and the, the clerk of the course called us to heal and I said to Tom I said you know let's not moan about each other we're going to lose our licenses on this one and of course we went in there both with helmets on because I thought Tom would take a swipe at me if I took mine off and with our arms around each other and convincing the stewards that we were, it was nothing unsavory about it and it was Tom at his best. Oh, Gordon wouldn't do that to me at all and all that stuff. And we got left off with a warning. But uh, that, was, that was a memorable race, 1977, I think. Tom Walkinshaw went on to become, like Andy Rouse, not only a tremendously gifted engineer, 
not only a tremendously gifted driver who won championships, um, but a tremendously gifted businessman. Walkinshaw founded Tom Walkinshaw Racing, or TWR as it was better known. And in 1980, TWR teamed up with Mazda and a driver called Wynne Percy. Percy and Walkinshaw's relationship went back to 1975 and Wynne's first touring car race, in which he won his class in a Toyota after a battle with Walkinshaw's Ford. It's the first time they've won the class, and they gathered round in the paddock afterwards saying, well done, you know, really pleased. And this stocky guy pushed his way through the little crowd, and he said, uh, Wynne's a funny name. I said, well, it's Winston. But they call me Wynne, you know, that's what I'm called. Hey, and this is your first touring car race? I said, yes. And he stuck his hand out and he said, I have to say, he said, you're very good. And one day I'll have my own racing team, he said, and uh, I'd like you to drive for me. And he shook hands and walked away. That's how we met. And we obviously became friends after that. True to his word, five years later, Percy would be driving for TWR in a Mazda RX-7. Well, he said, um, I'll pay you £6,000 to win the championship. But if you'd only win it, I'm not so sure I'll pay you. So we shook hands and that was my deal. And a tremendous effort being made here not to creep. And a beautiful start, a lovely start there. And it's Percy straight away into the lead. Alan tries to slot in behind him. They're very, very tightly packed indeed. The RX-7 had a radical wankle rotary engine. The amazing thing was that those days people didn't trust the rotary. It was a marketplace that, that Mazda wanted to get into. And racing the rotary RX-7 was a way of promoting it. It had to burn a little oil. That was what the car was designed like. And um, the first year, 1980, it had a megaphone exhaust on it, which absolutely blew your brains out. Uh, the noise of it was just amazing. We had to wear silencers the second year. So they had this massive silencer box on the back, across by the back bumper. But the amazing thing was it didn't lose any power. It was a very deceptive little engine, amazing little car. Percy won again in 81, but as TWR switched from Mazda to Rover, Walkinshaw told him he'd lost his drive. This was a cunning plan to reduce Percy's salary, but it backfired when Wynn was offered a Toyota drive for 82. And by winning his class in a Corolla, took a hat-trick of British titles. The funny thing was, I took the Corolla, won the championship for Toyota, and beat the Rovers, which is what he was hoping would win the championship. But during that year, and it was one Thruxton in particular, I remember, beating two of the Rovers um, in the 1600 Corolla over the finish line. And one of the drivers was Frank Sittner, who absolutely blew his top, poor old Frank, when he realised that this Corolla had beaten the Rover that he was driving, you know, because he felt that Tom had uh, shortchanged him. It wasn't that. It was that the Corolla was that good. It was crazy little car. It's fabulous. We had a number plate on the front with win one registration. Tom protested it, said it was an aerodynamic aid. <laughs> it was a bit bigger than it should have been and it was tipped slightly. But uh, anyway, we took it off. It was classic Walkinshaw who pushed everything to the limit. The rules are there to be overcome if you can. And Tom over overcame them brilliantly with, with allegedly Bless him, he's not here anymore, but I still find myself saying allegedly, um, allegedly petrol-filled roll bars and uh, things like that, which enable the car to go quicker. Uh, and that was fair game as far as Tom was concerned. He explored grey areas to the limit, yeah. Um, if there was a way out. I think you'll find, though, that most people did. They had their own tricks. I discovered that if ever Tom was up to what you'd call a trick or pushing a grey area to its boundary, the opposition found it difficult to do much about it because he also knew what they were doing. When you look at where Tom started, like typically trailing his car down from Scotland to where he finished as a multi-millionaire, having had a Formula One team with Benetton and then with Arrows and then ending up in Australia, uh, he can look back on his life with a great deal of pride and achievement. 
Walkinshaw's determination to play fast and loose with the rules would have a major impact on talented young Brit Steve Soper, who raced for TWR in the 80s. Soper had first entered the championship in a Metro, but would establish his reputation in a Rover V8. I'd been branded as a front-wheel drive person only that could only drive front-wheel drive cars, so there was a lot of, I suppose, um, nervousness w whether I could drive this Rover. And it was, it was so easy to drive compared to a front-wheel drive car. I drove the same in a Rover as I do in a front-wheel drive car as I did later on in BTC, you know, super tourings or prototypes. I never changed my, my drive and it was just a racing car and I drove it. So going back to what was in 1983 with a Rover, it, it was easy. I thought, goodness sake, this is so easy compared to, uh, you know, metros and fiestas and all the horrible things you had to do to those cars to make them work and be competitive. Suddenly the Rover was a breath of fresh air. The car would... Soper introduced a new level of professionalism and would be a works driver for the next 20 years. 1992 champion Tim Harvey, who also made his debut in a Rover, recalls Soper's impact. Steve was my hero because when I started in motorsport it was with Austin Rover. Steve was a factory driver, so I got introduced to him very early and I realised what a real professional Steve was. I always compared him to being the Ayrton Senna of touring cars. He was so committed. He knew every dyno graph for the engines, for the shock absorbers. He knew every engineer, whether it was in Germany or England. He really worked as a professional at being a racing driver 24 hours a day. And I learned an awful lot off him. He was also a stupendous talent behind the wheel. Steve achieved international success, you know, he raced all over the world in the world championships, drove for a lot of manufacturers, you know, and he was one of the kings of touring car racing. If we look at the, the two drivers that I, you know, I respect probably in my era of racing more than anything, then you'd be looking at Andy Rouse, I would put that in the same vein as maybe Jensen Button, and when you get to Steve Soper, then I would see Sebastian Vettel more in the way that they are, the way they come across, and the determination of winning. Steve was a very single-minded person. Steve was there to win. But for now, Soper's success lay in the future. Despite winning the 83 championship in TWR's Rover, a protest from another driver saw his car and the team excluded from the results. Everybody knew, really, that Tom sailed a bit close to the wind. and. Uh, Frank Sittner had a falling out with, with Tom at some stage and decided to um, get his revenge. So he protested Tom's Rovers at Donington at one of the races in, must have been 83. And uh, the fallout from that it wasn't resolved until 84. The argument went all the way to the High Court, but Soper would ultimately lose his championship to Andy Rouse's class-winning Alfa Romeo. I think we did win the championship for six months, <laughs> so, you know, but unfortunately I'm not in the record books uh, with the Rover. And it's, um, I mean, Tom did used to upset a lot of people on his way, um, and he certainly rubbed the, um, the scrutineer's nose in it and a few times over the, that year and previous years, and I think they were out to prove a point with him and we lost, I think six months later in a high court, we lost the championship because it, it had hydraulic tappets in the engine and I think they'd been modified so that they could be adjusted, not a, a far quicker, easier way. Didn't enhance the performance, but as far as the rule book were concerned, it, uh, the car didn't comply. They fought and fought and fought it and uh, we lost. So that championship, uh, flew away six months later. Once you've stopped and you look back, um, yes, it would have been nice to have been in the record books. At the time, I didn't, couldn't care less. In 1984, Walkinshaw wasn't just losing in the high court, his team was also being beaten on the track by Andy Rouse in a rival Rover. It was a bit ironic, really, because in 84, the year that it was finally resolved, I was driving a Rover against Tom Walkinshaw's Rovers and beating them. Halfway through the season, I think, I'd won more races in Rovers than they had. And so they retired. It looked quite bad on them because they were not only did they get disqualified for cheating, but they, got, they were getting beaten as well. We went on to win the, uh, win the class of the championship that year with the Rover. 
it would be Rovers' final championship success. A new era was about to begin with the launch of the revolutionary Ford Sierra. Next time on Touring Car Legends, mainstream TV brings touring car racing to the masses. Steve Soper's BMW meets John Clennon's Vauxhall, and Formula One world champion Nigel Mansell makes a cameo appearance with dramatic results. <laughs>